are in listen-only mode. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Jim Pfeifenberger talking to you from up in Seward, Alaska. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, second of the uh, marine science webinars that the Pacific Ocean Education team is putting on. Um, our goal is to do these at least quarterly, so our next one is scheduled for September 15th. You can go ahead and mark your calendars for that one if you want, but we'll make sure we get word out about it as well. And uh, before we get started, I'll tell you just a little bit about POET, the Pacific Ocean Education Team. It's a group uh, of Park Service employees um, sprinkled around both the Pacific West and Alaska regions. And uh, the group is chaired by Yvonne Menard down at Channel Islands uh, National Park. And I want to give her credit for really uh, sort of organizing the group and, and encouraging us to pursue this uh, webinar uh, method as a way to get uh, good information out to you folks. Um, so the POET group, uh, among other goals, uh, is the, um, aimed at supporting and aligning ocean stewardship work with other regions and national efforts. We desire to work with partners to conduct ongoing needs assessments for formal, informal, educational efforts and media outreach. And we hope to suggest, test, and promote new and innovative methods to provide a broad range of interpretive and educational outreach for ocean stewardship to the widest possible audience. And this webinar series is certainly a part of that latter um, goal. So before we get started with the webinar, just a couple of other housekeeping things. Um, part of this uh, ability to do this is thanks to the efforts of John Morris at the Alaska region. And I'm going to turn it over to him for just a minute to go over some of the mechanics of the webinar, and then we'll get started with the uh, content of today's program. John, Thank, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, this is John Morris. I'm an interpreter specialist here in the Alaska region. I'm happy to help facilitate these calls. Uh, basically, for anyone who's new to the webinar series, the way it works is since there's so many folks online, we typically require or keep everybody muted to keep the audio quality of the, the webinar in good shape. And so uh, to ask questions or to make comments anytime during the presentation, just use the chat box there, or the question box in the bottom of your control panel. You can type the message in and send it in, and uh, the staff of the, of the webinar here will, will monitor those, uh, will field the questions, and, and feed them to the, the, the presenter later on during the Q&A session. Uh, if you have comments just along the way or additional insights you want to add, you can throw those in there too, and we'll go ahead and copy those to the whole audience. So it is possible to leave your chat box open at the bottom of your screen or move it around so that you can see the presentation and have the chat box open. That works as well. So we are recording the session as well, and uh, both uh, I think presentation and the uh, recording of the presentation will be available afterwards on uh, SharePoint sites. So with that, uh, welcome everybody, and I'll turn it back over to Jim. Yeah, okay, and we'll try to get the word out as to where those things are available um, after the uh, presentation. Um, so uh, I guess it's time to move on to our presentation. Today's presenter is John Maniscalco, who has uh, worked at the Alaska Sea Life Center for the last 11 years, has focused all those years on looking at stellar sea lions. And uh, through the magic of a remote camera system, he's able to watch them from his office. I think he'll tell you a little bit more about that during the presentation. But I would wager uh, to say that John has spent more time observing the sea lions on Chiswell Island than anybody else alive. He spent a lot of time observing these guys over the last 11 years and has come up with some interesting uh, observations, with which he'll uh, share with us today in his presentation are Stellar Sea Lions on the Road to Recovery. So, um, John, if you want to take it away, we're eager to hear what you have to tell us today. Okay, thanks, Jim. All right, so, yeah, I'm going to tell you about what's happening with Stellar Sea Lion populations in Alaska and about my research here at the Alaska Sea Life Center. But this uh, presentation is based uh, a lot on what I've learned from the literature and talking with other researchers, but also a lot from what I've learned from my studies. All right, so stellar sea lions range across the North Pacific Ocean from California through southern Alaska and the Bering Sea over to Russia and Japan. There are two different genetically distinct populations. And uh, these two distinct populations are recognized in U.S. waters anyway, and that's divided at uh, 144 west uh, degrees longitude at approximately Cape Suckling, Alaska.
Now, the total stellar sea lion population has taken a major nosedive from the mid-1970s to 2000. The drop was seen totally in the western stock with relatively minor increases in the eastern population during that time. This decline prompted a threatened listing under the Endangered Species Act in 1990, and later in 1997, the western stock was listed as endangered. Now, there have been several hypotheses put forward to try to explain this decline. I'm just going to list a few of those here. First, uh, predation by killer whales, conflicts with fisheries, ecosystem changes from warming ocean temperatures and a shift in the types of prey that are available out there, and also the possibility of uh, disease or heavy contaminant loads. There has been close to $200 million spent on research over the past decade, but it hasn't brought us too much closer to understanding why the decline has happened. However, it has narrowed it down to probably one or a combination of these first three hypotheses. So I'm going to speak to those in just a little more detail here. So killer whales are the only known predator of stellar sea lions in Alaskan waters. And there's been some speculation that sleeper sharks or even salmon sharks might prey on stellar sea lions, but there's been no direct evidence of that. Now, the leading theory for predation effects was put forth by Alan Springer and colleagues, and goes basically like this. Killer whales used to be predominantly on large whales such as bowheads, rays, and sperm whales. But after the industrial whaling nearly wiped out most of those species, killer whales shifted to feeding on other prey, such as harbor seals, fur seals, sea lions, and then sea otters, uh, causing major population declines in these species in a nearly sequential manner. Now, this... Uh, this has been most, one of the most hotly debated hypotheses, with researchers becoming as polarized as Democrats and Republicans in their stance on this. Some say that killer whales never really fed to a great extent on those other great whales, but there is evidence to su suggest that the, maybe they did. And some data indicate that the prey collapses weren't really sequential, but they, that really might not be an essential part to this theory. Anyway, it could be very difficult to prove this theory one way or another at this point because a lot of the important data were just not collected during the periods of the population collapse. Okay, so there's also population losses from fisheries that may have come in two different ways, either indirectly by competition for the same resources or disruption of feeding or breeding patterns, or, or possibly by direct mortality from being entangled in nets or direct shooting by fishermen. Now, actually, direct mortality is known to have occurred for sure, at least to some extent, but it's a little harder to prove those indirect mortalities. So uh, an analysis conducted by Dan Hennon, who used to be here at the Sea Life Center with us for a while, indicated that rookeries around which the most intense fishing occurred had the greatest population decline. Now, this is something that manners can actually act on. And in the early 1990s, 10 nautical miles, no trawl zones were implemented for some fisheries around major rookeries. And in addition, three-mile restriction on vessels transiting around certain rookeries uh, were also enacted in the early 1990s. Now, population losses did slow or reverse around several rookeries after those measures were implemented, indicating that they may have helped. Now, another hypothesis. Okay, um, yeah, along with uh, slight increases in water temperature over the past decade, there were also obvious changes in the abundance of different types of fishes, giving rise to the junk food hypothesis. Now, this graph shows that with concurrent declines in stellar sea lions, there were also declines in the abundance of fatty forage fishes, such as herring, while during the same time, less fatty fish, such as walleye pollock, were becoming more abundant. So there have been several studies by Dave Rosen, Andrew Trice, and others that have linked these less fatty fish to reduced fitness and physiological stress in stellar sea lions during certain times of the year or during certain life history scenarios. Other researchers have not found such a link between the diet of pollock and reduced fitness. So this is another strongly debated hypothesis.
So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've been involved with over the past 11 years here at the Sea Life Center. The focus of our research has been in Atta Rookery, 35 miles south of Seward on Chiswell Island. It is part of the endangered western stock of stellar sea lions and on U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge land. And as we see here, the pattern and the magnitude of the decline at Chiswell Island has mirrored that throughout the western population. Now we have a number of remote video cameras set up on the island that were developed and are maintained by Seymour Wildlife Systems of Homer, Alaska. These cameras are equipped with real-time control via pan, tilt, and zoom functions and even have windshield washer, windshield wiper functions. The audio and video signals are sent to a control tower on the island via Cat5 cable, and the whole operation is run by a 12-volt battery system that is kept charged by solar panels, wind generators, with a methanol fuel cell for extra backup. There's also a weather station for real-time feedback on wind speed, wind direction, barometric pressure, and temperature. And at the Sea Life Center, we view the streaming audio and video from the comfort and convenience of our office. Um, and recording our observations to desktop computers and digital recorders. Now at this point we have a fairly extensive network of remote video signals which also view sea lions at additional haul outs in the area and also harbor seals up in Upper Ialic Bay for studies on their population dynamics. And this is a schematic drawing of Chiswell Island uh, with the main breeding area circled in red. We have six cameras during the peak season. They're placed across the short cliff uh, up above the rookery so that we can view the animals from different directions and uh, really have complete spatial coverage of the rookery. During the peak, se peak season, uh, which we're currently in now actually, uh, we have people watching all the happenings out there from about 4 o'clock in the morning till midnight on a daily basis. So there's really not too much that happens out there that we miss. Now, uh, yeah, here's a, here's a list of all the things we've been working on with this study. Some of these things are already completed, others are still ongoing. Uh, but anyway, I only have enough time to touch on a few of these, uh, few of the more important things here that we've been doing uh, with the time I have allotted. So many of these long-term studies can only be conducted by identifying individual animals and being a to tell the difference between one animal and another. And we've done this primarily by natural markings. Many of the stellar sea lions uh, get these circular patches on their bodies that are formed by a fungus. These often form unique patterns at various places on their body, and along with scars and unique flipper patterns, we can reliably identify a lot of these individuals from one day to the next and even from year to year. We really have histories on some of these animals uh, just by these means that span more than 10 years. Uh, but the biggest drawback this type of identification is that we don't know how sure don't know for sure how old these animals are. So in order to have um, positive identification of age in natal rookery, we have to go out there and mark these animals with either flipper tags or by hot branding them as pups. And the flipper tags are generally not as reliable as brands. They often become lost or difficult to read uh, by a few years of age. Whereas the brands last the entire life of an animal and are most often quite easy to read. read. <clears throat> so studies that uh, have looked into the effects of branding have found little or no lasting effects. Um, death would be an example of a lasting effect. Okay, uh, let's back up for a minute and we're going to review the reproductive strategy of stellar sea lions before we get a little more involved in the research that I've been doing. Okay, first of all, these animals are polygonous. Uh, the males are 2,000 or more pounds uh, when they're full adults. They defend territories, mate with several females. And here at Chiswell Island, uh, we have about six to 10 males that breed with uh, 60 or more females each year. Females become reproductively mature at three to seven years. And the males are, are reproductively mature at three to eight years, but generally not big enough to uh, hold the territory and breed with the females until they're at least 10 years old. Now, females, they give birth to a single pup, uh, generally late May to early July. 
perinatal period. Perinatal period is the time between when the female gives birth and her next foraging trip to sea. So they spend a period of time on the, on the rookery nursing their pups, and it's generally about 11 days at Chiswell Island. And they mate about uh, 11 days uh, after giving birth as well. Then, uh, as I said, they um, alternate foraging at sea and nursing their pup on shore for um, up to a year, uh, sometimes longer. Uh, but uh, typically, pups are weaned at one year or sometimes two or three years. Now, even though they mate 11 days after giving birth, uh, the embryo uh, doesn't really uh, implant into active gestation until the fall. Okay, so we see at Chiswell Island that the average age at first pupping is about five years, and this is uh, pretty consistent with previous studies conducted before and during the population decline. And uh, yeah, from this graph, sure enough, sea lions do mate about 11 days after giving birth, uh, and it's shown by the separate peaks for observed births and the subsequent copulations in this figure. Now, it has been shown uh, in previous work that virtually all reproductively mature females become pregnant every year. However, many fewer give birth in the following year. What happens is that some females will abort their pregnancy over the winter, possibly from nutritional or some other physiological stress. We see this happening with a few females at one of our remotely monitored haul-outs in almost every year, almost every winter. Uh, and this is a picture of a female that just aborted her fetus and is still nursing a pup from previous year. Now, uh, when they do give birth, uh, and we have uh, several hundred full-term stillbirths recorded on video at this point, uh, and uh, what these figures show that some of our earlier data, uh, females will give birth both heads first or tails first with equal frequency, and it really appears to be quite random. The same females may give birth in different directions from one year to the next. Yet the big difference is in the amount of time it takes for a pup to fully emerge after the onset of labor and heads first births are significantly faster than the um, posterior presentation. Probably not a big factor in the life or survivorship of these pups, but uh, just an interesting uh, fact that we learned from our studies. And another th cool, really cool thing that uh, we recorded was the first documentation of live-born twins in this species. Uh, this is an extremely rare occurrence and unfortunately, in this case, uh, both the pups died within a week or so uh, after give, being born, and uh, this is due partly to maternal neglect. All right, now let's look at the rates of reproduction for female stellar sea lions. Now, early studies have shown that natality rates uh, we're up around 67% prior to the onset of the major declines, then uh, dropped to about 55% during the declines in the 1980s. <clears throat> so um, back in the days of yore, they determined reproductive rates by collecting different females early then late in, in their pregnancy and cutting them open to determine their reproductive state. And these methods are no longer acceptable. So some researchers have taken to measuring reproductive rates by looking at ratios of females to pups on rookeries and haul-outs during the breeding season. But there's a lot of uncertainties and a load of assumptions that need to be made to do this. You can't really tell an adult female from a juvenile male on a haul-out. You don't know how many females are out foraging at the time of the survey, and you don't know what the ratio of pups have been born at the time of the survey, or how many pups may have been killed, died, or been washed away by surf, high surf conditions. So it's uh, really difficult to do uh, okay so really the proper way to determine natality rates is uh, to track a representative sample of females throughout their life and to determine how many pups they give birth to over time and we've been able to do that here uh, with our remote monitoring studies and uh, they display Chloe here is an example of a female that we've kept track of for eight long years. She gave birth in seven of those eight years that we knew her. Uh, 
Okay, so we don't really want to bias our estimates of natality with just females that we've known for a long time. So we did a more extensive modeling exercise using program mark and a larger and more representative sample of females. And I'm not going to really bore you with the details on the statistics here, but to develop a proper estimate of the proportion of females giving birth in any given year, we have to estimate sur survivorship, uh, the probability of reciting the animal, and how these statistics may be related to what state the animal is in, and the state being uh, either giving birth to a pup or not giving birth to a pup. And uh, the derived model uh, that most closely fit the data showed us that natality rates for this population were up around 69%. And this is fairly equivalent to the rates seen prior to the decline. All right, so this figure shows uh, different measures of reproductive rates or natality rates of females from the mid-1970s through the past decade. Now, these uh, estimates circled in blue show natality rates from the Pitcher et al. study from females collected in the field. And the dotted line shows declining natality rates estimated by National Marine Fisheries Service folks uh, using an inferential population dynamic model based on data of the proportion of portion excuse me, proportions of adult females and pups observed on the rookeries during the breeding season. And here, circled in green, are my average estimates for the past decade. Now, that's a huge difference between the NIMS estimates and mine. And so this, of course, got me wondering, am I really doing something wrong here? Um, you know, are the sea lions at Chiswell Island somehow that much more fecund than sea lions elsewhere in the Gulf of Alaska? So after... Uh, conferring with my colleagues and all, I decided that I'm probably not really that far off base with my findings. So uh, I tried looking for other ways to explain the big difference between my estimates and, and others. And uh, here's a theory that I came up with. Uh, it goes uh, like this. Uh, first of all, female odoriads are known to spend more time foraging during periods of food limitation. And this makes sense, and there's been a lot of good evidence to, uh, in favor of this. Now, there's also some pretty good evidence that uh, western stellar sea lions were nutritionally stressed during the 1980s. Nowadays, most researchers agree that western stellar sea lions are no longer nutritionally stressed, and therefore should spend less time foraging than in the 1980s. So let's look at this theory graphically to make sure this makes sense to everyone. In the mid-1980s, foraging durations were probably longer than normal. That means fewer females would be seen hauled out at any given time, and you would generally see a higher ratio of pups to females, giving you a decent estimated natality rate. For example, you might see 100 females to 80 pups hauled out on, on a certain rookery. Now, later in the 2000s, foraging durations were shorter and therefore more females would be seen on the rookeries. And that would decrease your ratio of pups to females, making you think natality rates have decreased. And now you might see 150 females for every 80 pups and think, wow, these females are having a hard time giving birth in recent years. Okay, so now there's really no direct evidence that this really occurred because not enough of the right types of data were taking over that long period of time. However, there is some very compelling circumstantial evidence that foraging durations did decrease from the mid-1980s uh, to the past decade from a variety of studies. And I say this is only circumstantial because these studies may not be directly comparable with each other because they were conducted at different rookeries and some of the methods uh, were different. So uh, anyway, there you have it. I think natality rates are just as good as prior to the decline, whereas other folks uh, may disagree. So let's look at a few other things that we've been studying here at Chisel Island. Here's a figure of perinatal periods at various locations. Uh, now remember, perinatal period is the time between when a mother gives birth and her next foraging trip to sea. And it has been thought that uh, perinatal periods are an indirect indicator of food availability prior to giving birth, in that the longer perinatal periods reflect animals that were well fed and would be able to spend more time caring for their pups before needing to feed again. And evidence for this has been shown mostly by studies at Año Nuevo Island, where 
during a strong El Nino year, perinatal periods were very short compared to when conditions were much better. Looking at the uh, uh, so here at Chiswell Island, we see that some of the longest perinatal periods um, uh, in this species at 10.7 here on the left. So I don't know if we just have an isolated population of super moms here, but um, you know things look pretty good here at Chiswell Island as far as perinatal periods and reproductive rates. Now if we go on and look at uh, foraging trip durations, we see some of the shortest foraging trip durations on average for this species during the summertime. But every year there's a pretty consistent increase in the foraging trip durations. Um, we see the same thing every year, mid-August, it just shoots right up. And uh, that may be an effect of several things, including changing availability of uh, prey around the rookery. Pups are becoming more mobile and may be able to travel a little bit with their moms. Or mothers are starting to look uh, for more sheltered locations and travel farther to look for haul-outs um, as weather conditions deteriorate. All right, now let's uh, take a quick look at pup mortality. Here's a figure showing the source and extent of mortalities over a seven-year period. We see that it uh, can be highly variable between years, with killer whale predation being a big factor in 2001 and 2003, whereas high surf conditions took many of our pups in 2002 and a, and a few other years. Now, we don't really know why there was a high number of abandonments in 2000, but uh, I might speculate that it was due to a poor year for uh, food availability. Okay, um, and it also looks like there might be a downward trend in pup mortalities over the years, uh, but that trend is not really statistically significant overall, and just maybe due to lack of um, killer whale predation in recent years. Okay, just a little bit more on killer whale predation here. Um, when killer whales did uh, come around Chiswell Island, it did seem pretty consistent. They would they would arrive in August and September um, in the years they did come around. This is a time that uh, young pups are spending more time in the water and learning how to swim, and so they're a pretty easy target for killer whales. We have not, however, seen many killer whales uh, around the rookery in the past six years. And we also see that the cause of these mortalities uh, can vary quite a bit with age. Uh, pups older than about a month of age are the ones that are really exposed to predation by killer whales, uh, whereas the youngest of pups are the ones that are swept away by storm waves. Uh, after about two weeks of age, the pups become uh, more coordinated, uh, coordinated enough to swim effectively and haul out on their own. And here's usually where I show a couple of dramatic videos of a uh, pup getting washed out to sea and another pup being saved by its uh, mother. But uh, yeah, I was told I couldn't really do that on these webinars, so um, you'll have to settle for a couple of relatively lame pictures uh, and use your imagination a little bit here. But anyway, yeah, this shows a uh, big storm that we had back in 2002, and uh, on the right-hand picture there was a mother going down to grab her pup and save it from the high surf conditions. Okay, looking on to uh, survivorship uh, beyond the first year, we're seeing average rates uh, between 70 and 80 percent for both males and female juveniles, and uh, which are considered average or maybe even pretty good among tandem heads. And, uh, and uh, increasing quite a bit uh, by the time they get into uh, adulthood. So now um, looking at all that we've learned over the past decade on this project, uh, maternal care is excellent, uh, natality rates are at least as good as prior to the decline. There seems to have been a decrease in predation on pups, and uh, juvenile survivorship has also been decent. Um, so what does this all mean for population trends? Well, we've actually seen a strongly increasing population in our area over the past 12 years. And this is based on numerous census counts over summer months. So we have some pretty fine-scale data here, and it, it's really looking pretty good.
And this trend is highly significant with an average annual increase of about 3.7 percent. Not, uh, not really terribly huge, but still things are looking promising. Now we are looking really at a relatively small area though in the range of this species. So let's take a quick look at what some recent NIMS data is showing. And here we are seeing about the same rate of increase throughout a large portion of the western stock of stellar sea lions uh, from the eastern Gulf of Alaska where Chiswell Island is uh, all the way through the eastern Aleutian Islands. But still, you know, not a humongous increase compared to previous declines, but um, Honestly, I would be cautiously optimistic after looking at these data and knowing what we know about natality rates and survivorship. But yet, uh, this is still not the full story. Okay, so um, out west, the sea lions have uh, still been declining uh, pretty strongly. And uh, we really don't have a good handle yet on what's happening out there. But for example, on Bald Deer Island, uh, where many thousands of sea lions used to breed, um, only one pup was known to be born there uh, in the past year. But some of the major hypotheses are still in play here, um, such as fisheries conflicts, uh, killer whale predation, uh, food availability, and the like. But the problem in these really remote areas uh, is that they're just really difficult to access. Weather conditions are often disastrous, and uh, that makes it all very expensive to work. And so interest in funding for these studies uh, way out there not come really easy, but uh, that appears to be changing in the near future as a few more studies are headed out west in the coming years. So even with the declines out west, the overall population trend has been positive over the past decade. And so I do think we might, um, and I stress might here, that uh, we might have seen the bottom of the decline around the turn of the century. But still, much work is needed to better understand why these populations fluctuate between years and over decades. And we can really only do this by long-term monitoring studies like we've been conducting here at the Sea Life Center. And so that's basically all I had uh, for you today. Um, I'd like to thank a lot of people that helped out with this project over the years, especially Pam Parker, who's been on this project for um, pretty much as long as I have and uh, been a huge help uh, identifying sea lions from year to year. And, and all that. And so, uh, yeah, left a lot of time left. So um, be happy to answer questions uh, if that's possible. Yes, thank you, John. This is Jim Pfeifenberger again. Uh, we really appreciate hearing a lot of information. And if folks do have questions, the way to pose them is to use the question box um, on your uh, panel over there and just type them in. We can't unmute everybody. And I will. Um, then pass the questions on to uh, John uh, verbally here so we can all hear him and hear his answer. And so uh, anybody who does have questions, please feel free to, uh, to type those in. I have a couple already, John. Um, some of this may have been covered in the program, but I'm going to just go ahead and, and ask him anyway to reemphasize. We have a question of how often do they have pups? Yeah, they'll give birth uh, every year, but not, well, They'll give birth to one pup per year, but not necessarily every year. Uh, that's shown pretty much by the natality rates being close to 70%. About 70% uh, of the mature females will give birth in any given year. Okay, great. Another question I have here is what is the population ratio of males to females? Mm -hmm. They think uh, that at birth it's, it's about equal. And then um, is there data on that for sort of the overall population? I don't know of any really good data on that for uh, the overall population. There, there's a little bit of difference in the survivorship rates of males and females uh, depending on their age, but um, I, I don't know that we have good estimates 
of that for um, the juveniles and adults that are out there now. Okay. Another question I have here is, are there any sustainability choices we can make, such as the types of fish we eat, that can avoid impacting stellar sea lions? Um, I'm going to pass on that one. That's, that's more of a question for, for managers. Okay. Um, and here's another one. What, if any, are the effects of human coastal development on the sea lion ecosystem? Yeah, that's tough to say. You know, a lot of these uh, sea lion rookeries are, are, are very remote and uh, where very little development takes place. You know, of course, there is, uh, you know, fisheries, uh, which have been limited, as I said, uh, around a lot of the major rookeries so since the early 1990s. So that may have helped. Um, you know, we've also got to be careful, of course, about uh, oil development in certain areas. But uh, really, these, uh, these uh, rookeries are, are, are very remote and have generally little other influence by uh, human presence. Okay. I'm going to continue. We're getting quite a few questions coming in here, uh, but we do have plenty of time still on the clock. What is the available evidence and your theory about foraging duration, say, about natality rates in the Western Aleutians? And is there evidence that, uh, I guess, natality rates are declining or not? Well, there's no direct evidence of that uh, that I know of. Um, and, and as I was saying, I, there's been very few studies out there um, because it's just such a difficult and expensive place to work. So that's something that hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about in the coming years. Okay. Uh, here's a pretty specific question about how can I get information about the stellar sea lion use of Sugarloaf Island in the Barrens? Mm -hmm. Do you know where data on that particular rookery or area is? Yeah, there there is some data on, uh, um, on the National Marine Fishery Service, uh, Alaska Fishery Science Center website, uh, but also the Alaska Department of Fish and Game um, has also been doing uh, work out there again in recent years. So um, you can check with uh, some of those folks in the in the Juno office on that. Okay, great. Um, is there any evidence that suggests that these populations were affected by the Exxon Valdez oil spill? Maybe just a little bit, but uh, since the declines started uh, before the oil spill, they don't think the oil spill had a, a predominant effect on, on those stellar sea lion declines. Thank you. Um, what about understanding the ecosystem changes as a context for explaining these changes? How does climate change vectors such as acidity or temperature impact the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that goes along with, uh, possibly goes along with uh, changes in the types of fish that are available to the sea lions uh, to eat out there and, and the whole junk food hypothesis. Yeah. These uh, ecosystem changes might be um, put into play here by changing ocean temperatures, but uh, I don't see that uh, changing ocean temperatures or acidities in and of itself would directly affect the sea lions, only indirectly um, through changes in their their prey, and, and that's uh, still um, you know a lot of work needs to be done there to try to understand these linkages and, and how they do affect uh, animals up the food chain up to uh, stellar sea lions so that that's that's a uh, pretty tough question and and we still got a lot to learn along those lines as well okay well the next question is about that junk food uh, hypothesis you indicated there is some disagreement about the junk food hypothesis can you elaborate more about the arguments for and against this hypothesis That that would uh, take more time than I have time here to, so I'd, I'd rather not get into that. Uh, if you could uh, just uh, read the literature that was uh, uh, suggested on that one page, and, and that will get you going quite a ways. And uh, let's 
see if I can get back to that. What one page was that? I'll, I'll see if I can bring that up. Oh, okay. You had some literature on one of your PowerPoint slides. Yeah, right. right, right. Yeah. All right. Can you see that? Yes, I think it's coming up here. And so you're referring to these studies down below. Exactly. And are those things that someone could locate online if they... Uh... Yes, very easily. Yeah. Okay, so leave that up for a second, and uh, we'll let the uh, questioner, you know, get a chance to write some of that down, which means I'm going to skip the next question. I'll get back to it because it asks for a specific slide, too. Um, so let me ask this question. Do you have a sense whether your natality conclusions based on Chiswell are applicable to the far western populations that still look to be declining. Right. And no, no, that there's there's something much different going on out there. Right? There's the, the natality rates here in the Gulf of Alaska uh, are probably much different than what's going on out there. So no. Okay, and here's a question um, this I actually sort of had a question much like this in my mind in that uh, you know let me ask the question as posed by the uh, attendee here, and then I'll elaborate a little my angle on it. It seems like much of the understanding we have about the local situation is due to the success of using remote video technology. Will this technology be used in more remote locations in the Western Aleutians? And sort of my spin on that, too, is, uh, you know, is there any indication that, say, you look at uh, some comparisons between Año Nuevo and Chiswell, and you're having this much higher, I think it was perinatal uh, foraging. Um, well, I'm not sure I'm using the right term, but you know the, the, yeah. the time they're able to spend on the rookery varied quite a bit, um, and you had some real high times for the Chiswells. Um, so my question is, is it just that they don't have enough data? I mean, is their protocol so different? Because you're getting so many observations, such detail with this video camera that you know, maybe you're seeing something that they're missing down there just because they don't have the same amount of, you know, the same ability to observe it in such detail. Well, maybe, maybe. Um, but it has been shown that eastern stock stellar, stellar sea lions, you know, from southeast Alaska and down to farther south, generally do have uh, a poor maternal care in that, uh, yeah, perinatal periods are shorter down there and um, foraging cycles are longer, foraging trip durations are longer. So um, it may not be too much of the more detail that we get from looking at the animals at Chisel Island. It, it may be just uh, real differences in uh, food availabilities between the, uh, the eastern stock sellers and, and the western stock sellers. And as far as uh, you know, a video system out in the Aleutian goes, uh, yeah, we are, um, looking into the possibility of doing uh, that sort of thing out there. But again, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult. Here at uh, Chiswell Island, and uh, it's really convenient because it's only 35 miles south of Seward, and we could beam the signal back here via microwave transmission and uh, get these images and, and audio back in real time, whereas out in the Aleutians, we're not going to have uh, something that nearby to where we can monitor these sea lines, so we'd have to use a uh, satellite link. And generally, the video is a bit choppier. Uh, we don't get an immediate response to the cameras. So uh, we, it's just harder to keep track of what's going on with a satellite link uh, remote video system. And, and we've tried out the satellite link remote video system on a few other uh, rookeries and haul out. And uh, it, it works OK, but uh, yeah, again, it's just not quite as good as having the microwave immediate link that we have here from Chisel Island to the Sea Life Center. OK, thanks. OK, here's a question asking you to pull up the slide again that shows the uh, range-wide population trends and review the situation out west. And Apparently, she's and rectify the stable line shown for Western Aleutians with the declining trend in pupping out there. What? 
So, well, I think um, so. If you had you have a slide that showed range-wide population trends, I believe. So that's where she. Okay. She's now. Asking. Okay. Now. Yeah. Okay. This probably does need a little clarification. <clears throat> Okay, now this is n not actually range-wide. This is a broader range than just what we've been looking at here in Kenai Fjords area. This is from the eastern Gulf of Alaska through the eastern Aleutians. Now, the next slide showed what's happening in the central and western Aleutians. So, much different thing there, and that's why, you know, uh, very few animals are being counted out there. So, does that clarify? Possibly go back to the slide before that. Is that supposed to say Eastern stock or is that Western stock? This is all Western stock, or yeah, all Western, all Western stock. stock, but not the entire Western stock. I see. Okay, you've split it into some sub uh, groups. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll hope that answers uh, the question, and uh, if not, she might want to pose another version of it or clarify. Um, I'm not sure we'll get to everything because there are a number of questions remaining on the list here, but we've still got some time. Um, one uh, question is what amount of mixing is there between the different groups? Yeah, yeah, really good question. <clears throat> um, you know, it sounds like, you know, back uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, when they did uh, some of those early genetic studies, uh, they found that these two populations, the eastern stock from 144 west to the east, southeast Alaska, and down, were, were really genetically distinct from the western stock. But just in recent years, it's looking like some more of these western animals are showing up um, in the eastern stock, and some of them staying to uh, give birth there and breed. Uh, this one rookery in northern southeast Alaska now that is made up of 50% uh, western stock animals and 50% eastern stock animals. So uh, there seems to be uh, perhaps a little more exchange um, in recent years. And it's, it's a little bit odd, it's a big head scratcher to me, why um, these western stock animals are moving to the east, whereas since the eastern population has is, is been increasing greatly over the past 30 years or so, uh, is, is not really moving to the west as much uh, as you would expect, or expanding the range to the west. So, yeah, that uh, hopefully answers that question. Thank you. Were the overall sea lion population numbers skewed as well by the greater foraging effort by all animals? No, I don't think that that probably did not have a major effect on on, on population counts because there's uh, because the decline was. So huge and so dramatic um, that you know, yeah, there may have been more animals out foraging during the 1980s when they were doing census counts, but uh, that probably did not have a huge effect on on overall population uh, trends. Okay, your uh, trends show about a slightly higher than three percent uh, increase in populations over the last. 10 years, mm -hmm. is this magnitude of increase considered significant in terms of wildlife population biology? Hmm. Well, I can tell you it's statistically significant, and whether it's, it's uh, really significant in terms of wildlife biology uh, is, is a little bit debatable. Uh, you know, since this population, the decline in the population was, was so much huger than uh, we've seen uh, increases. Uh, I don't think it it's hugely significant as far as uh, this population goes, but it is uh, a promising trend. Okay, what is the current population of killer whales, or how is the current population of killer whales compared to past populations, and could this affect the rate of population growth of the stellar sea lion? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's another really good question. Um, you know, these Gulf of Alaska transients, there's different 
you know, groups of uh, killer whales, um, different ecotypes of killer whales, and then among the ecotypes, uh, there are different groups. Now, the transient killer whales, the ecotype transient killer whales, are the types that breed on marine mammals. And within that eco transient ecotype, um, there are these Gulf of Alaska transients that seem to focus their predation almost exclusively on stellar sea lions, um, at least during some parts of the year. Now, uh, I've just heard talk about this, but I don't know that anybody's done any real uh, hard analysis on this, uh, that these Gulf of Alaska transients used to be much more abundant in, in uh, the 80s and 90s than they are now. So if these uh, Gulf of Alaska transients are declining in numbers, that might uh, that would uh, probably ease predation effects on these stellar sea lions and uh, allowing their populations to increase a little more. So um, that's pretty much all I know and don't know about that. So in theory, it could have an effect, but there's not a lot of hard data on it. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Or I don't know that anybody's done any of the, the um, detailed statistical analysis on, on population trends in these Gulf of Alaska transients. I've just heard a little bit of talk okay. about that. So there may be some data, but maybe that hasn't been crunched yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. At one time, I had learned that the birth weights of pups had dropped about five pounds from the 50s and 60s. With a s smaller pup to sustain, would this make for a more successful mother? Hmm. Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, I think the uh, pup size did drop a little bit from uh, the 70s prior it, into the 1980s. They, they were a little bit lower maybe in the 1980s. But um, that usually indicates that the, the mothers are not getting enough food, so they wouldn't necessarily do any better with these smaller size pups. Uh, they may be aborting more of the pups um, because of uh, food limitation. So. Okay, thank you. How far from the rookery do males and females range daily and seasonally? Yeah, um, during the summer months, they, especially the adult females, uh, might range pretty closely uh, because they, they're kind of tied to the rookery, having to come back and nurse their pups. Uh, so during the summer, they may range 5 to 10 miles, uh, probably not too much more. And, uh, you know, during the fall, they're, they're spending a lot more time out at sea they, and, and sometimes traveling to distant locations to look for more protected areas. So they're spending uh, a lot more time out there and, and traveling much further, uh, you know, 30 miles or more on, in some days uh, to look for food. You know. So it's, yeah, it's quite different uh, seasonally. Okay. Um, let's see. I just lost the question. There we go. Uh, what would you consider the strengths and weaknesses of the argument that the stellar sea lion decline and its subsequent recovery is associated with commercial fishing? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, what would you consider the strengths and weaknesses of the connection between stellar sea lion decline and commercial fishing? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that was... Uh pretty much uh, emphasized in Dan Hennon's study there. Yeah, I can pull that back up. No, 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 not that one. So yeah, yeah, um, you know, basically he showed that rookeries around which had the most intense fishery um, during the earlier years um, showed the greatest population decline. So that's, that's the, the strongest evidence that I've seen there that some of the fisheries uh, did have an effect on these uh, declines out there. Okay. Okay, yeah, sure. And uh, if uh, he wants to look into that study a little more, that may uh, go into a little more detail for him. He said that males are sex 
actually mature after three years, but usually do not mate until 10 years due to size. Are there any male sneak spawning strategies, such as how some fish species pretend to be females to get close enough to mate? Uh, yeah, there's some of the um, older juveniles that may, may try, but uh, it, we don't see it uh, happening very often. The uh, big males will generally chase off the younger uh, males uh, if they try to get in close to the females there. Okay, I have seen studies that look at scat content of stellar sea lions that argue that presence of scat is an indicator that the animals need a particular fish. How good are or aren't scat studies as indicators of what stellar sea lions need to eat? Yeah, scat studies are, are, are somewhat limited, uh, you know, because they're based mostly on, uh, on hard parts. However, you can do some DNA analysis of the scat to get a better idea of, uh, of the soft parts that are digested in things like, um, you know, squid and octopus uh, that they may eat uh, that uh, rarely show up in the scat. Um, so, so there are some limitations to scat studies. Uh, you can also, um, you know, look at um, blubber tissue to get an idea of uh, fatty acids that uh, may give you an indicator of uh, what they've been eating as well. But, you know, scat studies uh, have been pretty extensively used and, and, and do give you a fair idea of the types of fishes that uh, these sea lions are taking. Okay. Um, got time for about two more here, I think. I'll do one that says, uh, do you have enough long-term data to assess the rate of abortion or premature birth and to see if those are increasing or decreasing? Um, n not quite. I, I don't think qu quite so. We do see some interannual variations in the number of abortions out there on uh, one of the haulouts, but I, I don't think our sample size is big enough to look at any long-term trends there yet. Um, but uh, we, we are seeing some interannual variations there. Hey, there was one question that came up that uh, I think it probably needs a little clarification if you don't mind uh, sure in here and um, addressing that I'm going to pull up another slide here real quick okay now somebody said that uh, nymphs estimates population increases of the western stock at one point something like 1.5 percent whereas uh, this slide shows up uh, almost three and a half percent uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that this is not the entire western stock. Um, if you average in the next slide with the uh, sea lion declines out uh, farther west, uh, yeah, you would uh, catch an increase of about 1.5 percent. But again, just looking uh, at our area here, um, we're seeing uh, an average annual increase of about the same as what we're seeing on Chiswell Island. So that again tells me that our natality rates and other estimates may be similar to what's going on in the Gulf of Alaska area, but not necessarily farther out west, central, western Aleutians. Okay? Okay. Yep. Thanks for clarifying that. And the last one, this may be kind of a tough one, but uh, if you were going to recommend just three readings, because all of us are busy and don't have a lot of time, to get a good overview of the factors affecting stellar sea lion population change, what would you recommend? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, there's been a few big overview papers, uh, the uh, big NRC report, uh, but that you know it's still um, a little outdated. I would I would uh, you know recommend going to the uh, National Marine Fishery Service uh, Alaska Fishery Science Center um, website and and looking at uh, a bunch of their publications um, there and, and looking at uh, a lot of the work they've done. You can also um, uh, stop at the Sea Life Center website as well and, and look at some of the work, not only that I've done, but uh, a few other researchers here uh, have done. So um, I, I don't have titles right off the top of my head for that, but uh, yeah, if you go um, do a little searching uh, there uh, at those two websites, you can probably find some stuff that would help you out a lot there. Okay, well I want to thank you very much, John, for your time today. Uh, it's fascinating information and uh, 
obviously here in Seward, a species that we care a lot about because uh, um, we see them all the time here, and it's a big part of the attraction uh, to the marine environment up here. Um, and to anybody else listening, we'll try to get um, you know a recording of this posted uh, at some point in the near future, and let you know where that is. If you have uh, need to refer back to it, or have other folks you want to refer to it, again, the webinar series here is brought to you by the uh, Pacific Ocean Education Team. We're going to continue to try to put these on. Right now, our next one is scheduled for September 15th. We don't have a subject yet, but we have lots of possibilities. And uh, that's another thing I'll say is if any of you know of a topic you want to uh, see covered or you know of someone who gives a good talk about a marine science uh, subject, uh, please let me know. Jim Pfeifenberger, I'm on Lotus Notes. Um, or you can also let Yvonne Menard know. She'll pass that information on. And we look forward to uh, bringing some more science to you in September. Thanks again.